Natives, I believe, above all people, should disassociate themselves from this wicked ideology and expose, uproot, and attack it because natives have already been on the receiving end of this type of thinking. All right, settle in because this is going to be a good one and a long one. I figured I might as well jump into the frying pan with this first episode and start off with an extremely controversial topic. Why not? Now, this video is part of a three-part series called My Diatribe and will be a short dive into who I am, which will tie into both my criticism of identity politics and why I started this Chanel, this channel. Don't click that back button. There is a point to my short autobiography. There is a method to my madness. So let's get to it. I am half native, which means I am a breed, a mutt, a Heinz 57, a Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. And no, I am not offended by those appellations because I am more than those terms or those terms are less than me. My family on my mom's side is from three reservations, the Hopi Reservation, the Colorado River Indian Reservation, and the Miwok Tribe by Yosemite National Park. I myself have lived off and on the reservation. I have worked on a reservation for over 23 years now. I have friends and family that live on different reservations throughout the United States. I have a huge extended family on my mom's side with full bloods and breeds like myself. I have family members who are Hopi and Irish, Hopi and Dutch, Hopi and Seminole, Hopi and Kiowa, Hopi and Mexican, Hopi and Chimawavi, and full-blooded Hopi. Our family is truly one big glorious melting pot. I have branded cattle, pitched hay, ridden horses, played in canals, swam in canals, played king of the canal, and dressed, butchered, and slaughtered just about every animal you could think of on the res. I have eaten just about everything you could think of. And of course, the big question you are probably wanting to know, do I like fry bread? Of course, I'm half native. That's a given. I have two beautiful children who are actually more native than I am. I'll let you guys figure out the math on that if we are talking about blood quantum. So that's my native pedigree, my native street cred. The other half of who I am from my pop side is from the hills of Kentucky. And they were all hunters, hired hands, sharecroppers, and tobacco farmers. They were dirt poor, but good, honest, hardworking people of the earth. Now, I wasn't really raised around that side of my family. I was actually raised overseas till I was five. We lived in Iran, Italy, Germany, and Spain, and then came back to the States. My dad served 20 years in the military, two tours in Vietnam, was shot 10 times, survived, met my mom, and then had me. And he is one of the toughest, and I mean toughest men and fathers I know, and I love him. He's also my hero. And he's also fiercely independent and loves freedom. Now, to be honest, I get that from both sides of my family. The Hopi side is also fiercely independent. Some of the older traditional Hopi elders during the turn of the last century are some of the fiercest opponents of federal intervention. Their objection to federal intrusion is beyond historical dispute which their imprisonment on Alcatraz Island testifies to. That history alone is fascinating. And that guy right there is my great, great uncle. Now, you're probably thinking, why did you just list your background, your social and cultural capital? Well, the reason for that is because I'm about to cash it in, which leads me to this, my diatribe. As I stated at the beginning of this video, I am a breed, a man of two races, and therefore of two worlds. And because of that, I won't allow anyone to define me or pigeonhole me into some arbitrary category. That's a power I will never relinquish. I am native and I surf, I play guitar, I skateboard, I skydive, I shoot guns, I rock climb, I stand up paddleboard, I drink beer, and I listen to classical music and heavy metal. I am a devotee of both Bach and Slayer and know the two are not mutually exclusive. I follow truth at all costs. I am rebellious as heck. I have a wicked sense of humor and a million dollar smile. <laughs> and I am 100% a goofball. I love studying, I love reading, I study art, politics, economics, philosophy, literature, theology, history, and I never stop learning. And above all, I love being a father, and I love, love my children. They are the apple of my eye. I have also spent my entire life in construction. I am by trade a commercial electrician. Now, if all of that doesn't fit into someone's mold of what a Native American is or is supposed to be, then good because my identity doesn't depend upon someone else's definition. If my skin color or facial features don't meet someone's expectation or my ratio of native to non-native blood doesn't fit some narrowly defined utopian purity standards, then good. The truth is, maybe you just haven't met someone like me before. Someone who takes delight in shattering molds, 
Please understand, I am not bragging. Every human being is unique. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. So what I'm about to say, I say in a spirit of brotherly kindness, I truly do. But maybe your conception of what a Native American is, is a conception of an indigenous person frozen in the past and does not reflect our contemporary existence now. And I say this to both non-natives and natives. Now, you may be thinking, dude, why are you so adamant about these things? Good question. I am animated because some people today have lost their minds and have embraced dangerous ideologies, worldviews, paradigms, or belief systems as a substitute for thinking. Believing that these ideologies will make this world a better place when all it's going to do is tear it apart. And as a consequence, right now, because of these belief systems, the individual is under attack. Now, let me explain what I mean. There is a particular insidious worldview called identity politics that says that who you are as part of a group is more important than who you are as an individual and that everything in life, including all of human history, must be viewed through the lens of the group to which you belong and that the supposed group to which you have been assigned into somehow not only defines who you are, but determines whether or not you are an authentic person, whether or not you should be given a voice to speak, and whether or not you're a part of a dominant or oppressed group of people. You as an individual are no longer judged on an individual basis, like your character, but instead are to be judged by your group membership. And what worries me is not those people who blindly accept and follow every tenet of this radical worldview. What worries me is those people who have absorbed, perhaps unknowingly, the spirit or underlying ethos of it without critical reflection. Because part of this ideology's appeal is that it sounds just and moral, which seems to give it a degree of plausibility. And part of this ideology's strength is its ability to attach itself like a virus and replicate itself using the mechanisms of a host culture or host epistemology, which is where most people's street level understanding of this issue resides. And it does this by using language deceptively. It retains the same words, but replaces them with different meanings. And what makes this ideology so confusing and hard to grasp is first, this is by design. Identity politics takes its cue from postmodern philosophy and what is called specifically deconstructionism in which you attempt to deconstruct, dismantle, and subvert everything, including language, to expose invisible power relations. This is why the term identity politics seems at first glance to be a non-controversial statement, in which case this ideology would be much to do about nothing. However, that is not what the phrase identity politics means. It refers to the individual's identity subsumed under and absorbed into a homogeneous glob of the group. And what the identity of these groups share is either differing degrees of oppression or differing degrees of domination. Your own autonomy and sovereignty as an individual must take a back seat to the group from which you are frozen, locked into, and defined indefinitely according to this paradigm called identity politics. And the reason why I am so animated about this way of thinking is not only is it conceptually wrong, but it's dangerous and has been used in the past to justify horrible atrocities especially in just the last century. When you judge people according to physical characteristics and assign them to a group, you are following in the footsteps of a very dangerous precedent that history has already shown repeatedly what this type of thinking leads to. Natives, I believe, above all people, should disassociate themselves from this wicked ideology and expose, uproot, and attack it because natives have already been on the receiving end of this type of thinking. This type of thinking led directly to what is called by different names as the displacement era, the removal era, the eradication era, and the assimilation era of native people. Now, I am gonna sound like an older brother here, but man, you better know your history, your people's history, before you join forces with an ideology that is destructive of your own culture. This way of thinking is a threat, and I'm gonna unfold this by using myself as an example. This is me jumping into the frying pan, Here's the million dollar question. What do you do with someone like me, who is a breed, who is essentially made up of two races? Is half of me, which is supposedly part of the dominant group in society, imposing hegemonic power on the non-dominant groups in society? And if this is true, does that mean that half of me is doing the oppressing while the other half of me is being oppressed? Should I both atone and accept my own atonement for such injustice? 
Am I forever doomed to feel both guilt and absolution? Does half of me have an authentic voice while the other half has to remain silent forever? How does that even work? Now, what's wrong with this way of viewing the world? This worldview is legion, but I'll focus on just one aspect in this video. This view of the group as having priority over the individual and that who you are as a member of a group is determinative of your position in society or what this belief system refers to as privilege and power is extremely authoritarian. Let me explain by using an analogy. If you are familiar with any of the various academic disciplines, you realize there is an outstanding divergence of opinion within the separate disciplines and that there is more intramural disagreement between the individuals that make up a discipline than between the different disciplines. There are epic debates within each discipline over methodology, application, what constitutes the demarcation boundaries of the discipline, and tectonic paradigm shifts occurring beneath the surface within those disciplines. In essence, there exists more intragroup disagreement than intergroup disagreement. This not only demonstrates the wonderful diversity of opinions, ideas, and beliefs that all human endeavors and groups are permeated with, but these internal debates and disagreements also demonstrate the intellectual pursuit of objective truth and an openness toward counterfactual evidence as a means to revise, confirm, or get rid of false knowledge and information. What these scholars are hopefully doing is trying to get to a deeper understanding of reality. This is not only essential to science and academia, but to knowledge itself, to life itself. Now the truth is, we don't even need this fancy example to bring this point home because we all know immediately that within our own intimate groups that we are a part of that this reality exists. For example, sometimes we have more internal disagreements with our own families than with our next door neighbors. We sometimes get along far better with our next door neighbors than our own intimate family members. I'm not going to belabor this point because I know you all know it's so demonstrably true. This is not shocking or new information, but is a normal part of life. Now, why is this important? Well, this same feature of the group dynamic of internal disagreement, whether at the academic or familial level, also afflicts this ideology that we are discussing. The individuals that share this ideology do not themselves share a unity of opinion, ideas, or beliefs on what exactly they believe in. They suffer from the same intergroup disagreement that all groups suffer from. However, here is where things are profoundly different. This normal everyday reality is compounded by the fact that this group is not open to feedback, criticism, or challenges to its orthodoxy. So what does this mean? This means that the notion that a group of people has the epistemological ability to assign you as an individual into a group based upon nothing more than your physical characteristics is not only unwarranted and reductionistic, but is disproven by that group's very own lack of agreement on what constitutes or defines a group, including their own group. Identity politics and the group that coalesces around this belief system is so full of infighting and massive subdivisions based around competing claims to which members of their group qualify as the most oppressed that any agreement they come to is quickly vitiated and spoiled. What I am trying to show is that the very thing this group claims to possess and be solidified around is the very thing they don't possess. They don't possess a unified position. In other words, the very root of this ideology doesn't itself have a shared identity. Either those who hold to this ideology aren't aware of their own inconsistency, or they are merely pretending, which means they really don't know who to let in and who to leave out. Because the selection process is as arbitrary as the foundation it is built upon. That's why this particular worldview doesn't know what to do with someone like me, a breed, because I don't fit into their neat and tidy racial boxes. Thank God I don't. What a suffocating worldview. However, this phenomenon does explain precisely why those who hold to this worldview are canceling and censoring other people. Not because there is differences of opinion, but precisely because they reject any differences of opinion. They not only do not accept any divergence of opinion, but view those who hold counter opinions as heretical to their movement. Which is why this worldview must excommunicate those outside its faith. In the final analysis, this worldview, this identity politics, because of its lack of evidence and reason, is not only extremely close-minded and dogmatic, but is an example of a secular cultic religion. 
This is a system of thought that shuns falsification and lives inside an illusionary world of confirmation bias, in which nothing can disprove it, but everything can prove it. In other words, this worldview, because it is not open to counterfactual data, is nothing more than a blind faith. It is a worldview that at its most basic level says this, do this because I say so. It is the oldest trick in the book, disguising might makes right as benevolence. This ideology commits the fallacies of both the argumentum ad vericundium and the argumentum ad baculum, the argument from authority and the argument from force. Now, please don't misunderstand me. There is real racism and discrimination in this world. There are real imbalances of power in this world. The existence of hegemonic power structures is real. And there are real flesh and blood human beings suffering from oppression. However, this particular worldview not only exacerbates the problem, but creates further division and is not only convoluted, contradictory, and confused, but is not equipped to make this world a better place. Identity politics not only creates a toxic, heightened racial and gender-driven atmosphere, but turns our fellow human beings into enemies. What I'm about to say will offend some people, but I have to say it. I swear if there was an ideology that Satan himself could have conjured up, this would be it. It turns people against each other, makes them suspicious of each other, flips language on its head, is based on deception, creates a toxic environment, and turns the color of our skin and our gender into an idol. It is a caustic acid that will not only burn through native culture and tear families apart, which I believe it is already doing, but it will also dissolve everything it touches, including every other culture. This worldview appears benign and liberating, but beneath the surface it is a malignant cancer. Now, what I am trying to show is not only how convoluted this type of thinking is when you actually apply it to real flesh and blood human beings, but also how dehumanizing this is when you deny individuality and attempt to pigeonhole people into a group. This is why I mentioned at the beginning of this video all the things that make me me, like my background and the things I do. I wasn't bragging, there was intention. It's not only who I am and what I believe, but what I do that defines me, but also you as well. And any attempt at singling out one attribute or one strand that makes me me or you you to the exclusion of all the others, not only defaces my unique God-given individuality, but my personhood and yours too. And if this ideology can attack someone like me, who is a breed and who has worked and lived upon the reservation for more than half my life, and whose family is native and whose own children are native, then how much more proof do you need on how destructive this ideology is? Now, I kind of danced around this issue earlier and said that this ideology doesn't know what to do with someone like me because I am a breed, but that's not completely true. Because I reject identity politics and do not conform to their conception of how my group membership as a Native American should think, then not only am I persona non grata, but I'm also branded as an enemy by this system of thought. And man, I got to tell you what, I kind of like that. I relish it. I am bred and born for rebellion and battle. And that's one appellation I will accept. Now, the situation is actually far worse and more hilarious than that because this is a system of thought that categorizes and accuses me of adopting an appropriate and oppressive epistemic mindset of the controlling class and that I have somehow unconsciously internalized my oppression, which has given rise to a false consciousness as an indigenous person, and that one half of my racial identity is dominating the other half of my racial identity. In a nutshell, I am accused of being both a sellout by this ideology and discredited as lacking authentic knowledge. Now, this shouldn't come as a shock. This is part of what I spoke about earlier when I said that this ideology is unfalsifiable. It counters criticism not by attacking the argument, but by attacking the individual. Its entire defense is to attack the integrity and character of the person. It specializes in the ad hominem fallacy. That's why I said that once you understand that you are dealing with a secular religion, then everything falls into place, because either you are with them or against them, just like Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, except this is a very strange Gospel and a very different religion indeed. Now. All joking aside, this ideology is really just a flipped over secular version of Christianity, minus grace and forgiveness, and minus the supernatural aspect. 
which I will be talking about more either in episode three or possibly in a postscript follow-up video. Now, how do you counter this insidious worldview? Here's the answer. You defend the individual. You focus on the individual. What I'm about to say will hopefully challenge your belief system and disrupt the narrative you may have unknowingly adopted. Or maybe you'll disagree with me, which is fine. But it's this. At root, contrary to what most people think, it is the individual that is the truest minority in society. Let me repeat that. It is the individual that is the truest minority in society. It's within the individual that skin color, facial features, and gender reside. It's the individual who experiences fear, pain, joy, happiness, and love. It's the individual who has hopes and dreams. It's the individual that can be crushed at any moment. It's the individual that must be protected. Because once you lose the individual, you lose society, you lose the group. However, and this is extremely important, not just for native people, but for all people. This is not to say that the parts are greater than the whole, or that one must somehow decide either between the individual or the group. I reject the notion that says you must choose either between the individual or the group, and the notion that says your identity in a group is more important than your individuality. Both choices are false choices. It is not an either or choice, but a both and choice. I embrace both individuality and the group. You can't have one without the other. This is where I personally differ from many social commentators, economists, and sociologists who start with push for and celebrate individualism as a counter to collectivism. I am opposed to both. In other words, I celebrate the individual, but not individualism. I celebrate the group, but not collectivism. As soon as you add that suffix ism to the end of a word, it changes the word and it now becomes a philosophical system, theory, or worldview. For example, I am a human being, but I don't believe in humanism. I believe in my own existence and in the existence of other people, but I don't hold to existentialism. I believe in a healthy, functioning society, but I don't believe in socialism. I believe in community, but not communism. And I believe in individuality and the individual, but not individualism. You can accept one without embracing the other. Now, in an effort at full disclosure, I am somewhat sympathetic towards what is called methodological individualism as a starting point for analyzing society. However, I am critical of that method when it begins to lean too heavily towards atomistic individualism or a form of social nominalism and defines the group, society, or community out of existence. And I think many well-intentioned people have gone astray, defending that which is blatantly undefendable, and have gotten their beliefs all twisted up, attempting to justify and defend the individual, which is correct, but you don't have to adopt individualism to defend the individual. I mention this because some aspects of identity politics correctly identifies the conceptual errors of certain forms of untethered individualism. However, they go too far in the other direction. Now, why is this important? Some of you may be thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> or others that this is just a distinction without a difference, Jason. What's the big deal? First, just follow me. That's all I ask. And you'll see where this argument is going. Second, this is a reality you cannot deny, escape, or get around. And third, it's a big deal because family, extended family, friendships, and community are important, not just for native people, but for all people. Think of how many roles you play as an individual. Many of us are sons, fathers, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, and we are also co-workers, friends, leaders, and mentors. This list could go on and on. The point is the individual and the groups we are a part of are not only undeniable aspects of reality, but essential to who we are. Both the individual and the groups we belong to are what make us us. To borrow a word from sociology, community is how we contextualize ourselves in this world. And it's what gives life meaning. This reality of the community, of the group, is especially relevant to those individuals, those people who believe that the greatest community that one can be called into is to be part of the body of Christ in a local church. The religious dimension of community is extremely important. Adopting individualism or collectivism to counter each other is not the answer. This is where clarity of thought is so important, and that's why I belabor this point. Because we, as human beings, are not born in vacuo, into a void. We are born into a family, into a group, into a tribe, into a culture, into possibly multiple overlapping cultures. So that to ignore the group 
is just as wrong and futile as ignoring the individual. The individual and the groups that we belong to are a spectrum both of the individual's choosing and those they are born into. As we get older, especially in modern society, which is a gift in itself, a new continuum opens up for the individual, where we begin to choose the groups we as individuals want to be part of, which demonstrates the undeniable existence of both realities, and also the rich interplay between the individual and the group. And as soon as these realities are severed from each other, the individual from the group or the group from the individual, then not only do we get a very truncated view of reality, but problems inevitably ensue. And what we are witnessing today is not a corrective ideology, but an ideology focusing on only one aspect of our existence to the detriment of the other, which is necessarily unhealthy. This is why forcing identity or identity politics upon the individual is as wrong as it is totalitarian, because one's identity is not frozen in time. Life is both the individual and the group. Forcing people to choose between one or the other is a failure to understand the multifaceted, interconnected reality in which we live. There is both diversity and unity in this world. And when you elevate unity over diversity, you crush diversity and vice versa. Today, however, because of a serious lack of thinking, people are demanding, forcing, and canceling other people because they themselves have adopted a misguided epistemology, a wrong way of thinking and viewing the world. And because of that, right now in our society, the individual is under attack. So if I, a person of two races, can somehow jump into the fire, Metallica, and highlight and demonstrate the beauty and greatness of individuality, and expose the dangers of what happens when that precious gift is eclipsed, then I'll gladly do it, which is one of the reasons why I am starting this channel called Native Liberty. With that being said, I'll end this first part of my diatribe. Non duquo duco. I am not led, I lead.